There's an ISIS militant who essentially is the front man in the various beheading videos that they've released. And investigators apparently have been able to piece together who he is. So up until now, he's been called Jihadi John. But his real name is Muhammad Mwazi. And his story is very telling for multiple reasons. So Reuters says the following about him, quote, he was born in Kuwait and comes from a prosperous family in London where he grew up and graduated with a computer programming degree. He was believed to have traveled to Syria around 2012 and to have later joined ISIS. Two U.S. government sources told Reuters that John grew up in West London and graduated from the University of Westminster in London with a degree in computer programming. CAGE, which campaigns for those detained on terrorism charges, so it's a group that does that, said Mwazi had got in touch with Cage, saying that he had been harassed by British security, security services after trying to take a trip back to Kuwait in 2010, where he was going to get married and had a job waiting. Quote, I felt like a prisoner, only not in a cage in London, he wrote in an email sent to Cage at the time. He felt like, quote, a person imprisoned and controlled by security service men who who's stopping me from living my new life in my birthplace and my country, Kuwait. Cage uh, blamed his radicalization on alleged harassment by counterterrorism officials after he was detained in Tanzania with two friends in August 2009 when they arrived there for a safari holiday. Cage said that MI5 had tried to recruit him as an informant and a year later blocked his attempt to return to Kuwait, where he had begun working for a computer programming company and planned to marry. Now, Cage also says the following, quote, We now have evidence that there are several young Britons whose lives were not only ruined by security agencies, but who became disenfranchised and turned to violence because of British counterterrorism policies. Now, here's why this story is great. It's a Rorschach test. So what does that mean? Well, it means that what you see in this story, what you take away from this story, says more about your own prejudices and your own ideology than it does about the actual facts of the case. So again, what do I mean by that? Well, based on this specific set of facts about what led to this guy becoming radicalized, you can say either that he was radicalized because of bad policy from the West or that this was purely ideological. Now, what are the two arguments for both sides? Well, obviously the argument for the side of he was radicalized by the West is he felt like he was harassed by MI5 and he felt like he was harassed by the intelligence officials and uh, they restricted his travel at certain times and uh, this was essentially the, the spark that lit the fuse and then eventually he's beheading people and look, blame the West, look at what happened. If they didn't do it, then he would have never went down that path and reached that end goal. So that's the argument that, hey, bad policy is responsible for this. But the counter argument is, whoa, whoa, whoa. This dude wasn't in poverty. This dude uh, didn't have serious uh, economic and cultural issues and problems, and he wasn't repressed. Again, he, can't, he has a computer programming degree or computer engineering degree or whatever it is and he's from a prosperous family and he lived in London so we're not talking about somebody who's you know impoverished and going through degradation and you know moving from one place to another no stability in their life and don't have access to modern healthcare modern amenities and TV and all this great cultural entertainment stuff that would you know take up your time if you're somebody growing up so that's interesting, isn't it? That you have this breakdown. There's one argument that he was purely, he only turned to terrorism for ideological reasons because he had everything at his fingertips. Raised in London, uh, not poor, in fact, fairly wealthy, had a degree, went to school. So that's the argument, purely ideological. And the other argument as well, the spark that lit the fuse was the intelligence agencies being repressive and yada, yada, yada. So which side is right? Because again, it's interesting, this is a Rorschach test. So what you're gonna see with stories like this is, oftentimes you're gonna see, the conservatives will just point to the fact that it's ideological and they'll say, look, like, like I just described, the dude was not in poverty, he went to school. 
He was living a normal life, and then he just decided, fuck it, I'm going to join ISIS, and I'm going to behead people. So you'll have conservatives point to that, and also, you'll probably have atheists point to that, right? I, you know, Sam Harris oftentimes makes the argument that, you know, liberals are wrong when they say economic uh, circumstances and political circumstances and cultural circumstances push people into being terrorists. No, the ideology is the main thing that you have to pay attention to. You have to look at what the... The holy book teaches, and then they're just following what the holy book teaches. So, you'll have atheists and conservatives more saying, well, it's purely ideological. And then you'll have the liberals and the progressives saying, no, 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 it's probably not even ideological at all. Because it's, you saw the spark that lit the fuse, was he said, the, the government's, uh, the intelligence agencies and the government's repressed me and restricted my travel and made my life a living hell, and then that's what led me down this path. So, what's the answer? Both, 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 both. I can't tell you how many times I've made this argument on the show, and I get so much hate from both sides. This is why people, I, I got into an argument with Sam Harris himself, because I said to Sam Harris, look, you and Gre Glenn Greenwald are both smart people, and you're talking over each other's heads, because Glenn Greenwald is focused on the problems of the United States and the West and our foreign policy and the NSA and our restriction of civil liberties and imperialism. And that's his uh, realm of expertise and his focus as a journalist. And yours is b uh, beliefs or ideologies and their consequences. So you're more a neuroscientist and a religious expert or an expert on religion. So you're just approaching the situation from different angles and you're both making good points. So in this case, what do I think is the answer? I think both things contributed. I think it's probably true that a lot of this is ideological because he was wealthy and he did go to school and he did grow up in the West and he chose to still go with the ideology of fundamentalist Islam. But then you could also say, would he have ended up there if he didn't feel like he was, uh, you know, repressed or he felt wronged by the intelligence agencies when they restricted his travel and tried to recruit him and were harsh on him uh, constantly and, and pestered him on a regular basis because they thought he would become radicalized. Yeah, that probably plays a role too. And in conclusion, let me just say real quick, each situation is its own individual case, and you can't just make broad, sweeping, generalized comments. And that's often what you see. You see a lot of atheists and a lot of conservatives say, it's always ideo ideological, especially when the Muslims do it. It's always ideological, it's always based on the holy book, they're just following exactly what the book says, and that's the problem. And then you always have the liberals say, no, there's always something deeper that goes into it, and there's always something uh, that explains it that's cultural and, and political and economic, and there's all these different things. And look, like I said, each case is individual, so in this case, probably both factors weighed into it. In the Charlie Hebdo case, that's purely ideological, because they killed somebody specifically for drawing Muhammad. <laughs> right? So you can't say, well, blame the Western foreign policy. No, you only blame uh, the fact that they believed, based on the Hadith, that you can't draw Muhammad and they'll kill you if you draw Muhammad. When you look at the radicalization in Qatar, we spoke about this the other day on the show. That's purely ideological. It's an oil-rich little nation that America does business with, and we make them rich. But they have state-sponsored jihadis come and speak at their biggest mosque and their most popular mosque. You can't blame that on poverty. You can't blame that on other factors because they're an oil-rich nation, but they're choosing to be a jihadist and to be fundamentalist, ultra-Orthodox Muslim. Sunni specifically, Wahhabi specifically. Saudi Arabia, same thing, purely ideological in that case. But then there's other cases that are purely based on other factors, I would argue. Like in Iran, increased radicalization in Iran in the 1960s was based off the fact that the U.S. in 1953 overthrew a democratically elected leader, Mohammad Mossadegh, because Mossadegh wanted to nationalize the oil industry to make the people of Iran wealthy. And the U.S. was taking the oil at the time, so he said, fuck that. We overthrew the guy with the CIA, uh, put in the Shah of Iran, a dictator, and then he gave us the oil. So the increase in radicalization was based on a revolutionary sentiment that we've been wronged. So it was actually more nationalist in its goals than it was religious. So that's not purely ideological. That does have to do with uh, culture and politics and sociology and economics, because they were getting screwed in that realm. The Palestinians, too. The radicalization in the Palestinian territories is not purely ideological. It, it, then why does it happen to perfectly coincide with the occupation. Uh, radicalization increased when the Palestinians uh, were occupied uh, by the Israelis.
you know, that's, you can't just point to ideology for that and religion for that. There's an obvious link between, uh, you know, geopolitics and economics and, and other factors that go into it. So again, I know I'm stressing it and I'm repeating myself too much at this point, but in most cases, it's probably a mix of factors, okay? You have everything that goes into it. Ideology and the beliefs themselves, but also uh, culture, uh, sociology, uh, politics, uh, economics. And in, some, and in some cases, it is purely ideology and purely the beliefs themselves. In other cases, it's purely the opposite, purely those other factors.